God's people have been freed from exile in Babylonia. They're finally home. They have now rebuilt their temple. They have rebuilt their city. And they have rebuilt the walls of the city. And so now they ask that the priest, Ezra, read to them the law. Because before they've rebelled against the law and suffered the consequences, now they want to hear it again so they stay on the right track and learn that the law is not to oppress them, but to give them light so that they might know the path that God has put out for them and find happiness. So here's the story. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for that purpose. Please go to verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra pleased the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Please go to verse 8. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the meaning. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who were from the beginning, were witnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theolophus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Now please go to chapter 4, verse 14, page 1206. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today, 
the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. These first verses of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, are important for he describes why he has written it and the care he has taken to compose it. These four verses are followed immediately by a section called the Infancy Narrative, where Luke tells the story of the Annunciation and birth of Jesus, of John the Baptist and of Jesus. It is followed by the baptism of Jesus and Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The next part of Luke's Gospel brings us to today's Gospel in chapter 4, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. You know, all of us are quite familiar with inaugural addresses, especially when presidents of our country take office and begin their elected terms. Unfortunately, much of the content of these inaugural addresses bear little relationship to the actions of these presidents subsequent to their addresses. I would like to look at this segment of Luke's Gospel as Jesus' revolutionary inaugural address. In this address, this young rabbi uses scripture to describe what his ministry is going to be about. Jesus tells him he has come to number one, proclaim good news to the poor. This is his number one major concern in his mission. You know, it dawned on me as I was preparing this homily that every time Father Jay talks to us about justice and concern for the poor, he must indeed have this gospel in the forefront of his message. Secondly, set captives free. Third, recover the sight of the blind. Set all liberty, those who are oppressed. And proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a biblical way that Jesus proclaimed a jubilee year. Well, as you know, Pope Francis has wisely designated this year of 2016 a jubilee year, a holy year of mercy. We too must open our ears and hearts to the Holy Spirit as we ponder the scriptures each and every week. Can we make Christ's vision come true? It seems to me that the answer is yes. And to the extent that it isn't, it isn't yet true, we can work on it to make it come true. As a matter of fact, we must make it come true. A huge part of our human misery is found in our human rejection of that visionary declaration of Jesus. We can, however, do our part to make it come true if we put aside our human differences, accept our common shared humanity, and live as members of one human body in shared common good. Today, you and I, by the way we live our lives and relate to others, ought to be able to say, today this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. These words are the core of Jesus' message to both the people of his day and the people of our times. But you and I both know that we have a long way to go in order to live in fulfillment of the scriptures. Here are just a few of the issues which we as disciples of Christ need to address. Every year, there are those who want the celebration of Christmas to be suppressed and supplanted with a celebration of what they want to call the winter holidays. Abortion, euthanasia, the degradation of marriage and the dissolution of what we mean as the word family, along with a bogus morality that is nothing more than simply don't get caught. All are ravaging our culture. Freedom of choice has been changed to mean that you have a license to do whatever you feel like doing so long as you, don't get, a, as long as you get away with it and you feel good about it. 
Separation of church and state is continually invoked. I think we are now entitled to ask whether separation of religion and morals from public life has brought us to the crisis in which we presently find ourselves in our culture and society. Jesus Christ's vision, values, and activities match the words of his inaugural address. He died to bring freedom to those held captive in webs of lies and deceit, to those held captive in addictive behavior patterns, along with freedom to those held captive and victimized under exploitative power. His vision brought us light, light in which to see the truth plainly and simply, so that we could say yes plainly and simply when we really meant yes, and no equally and plainly and simply when we mean no. The Bible isn't so much a creed to be accepted, as it is a task to be accomplished. We with Christ, and since Christ lives within each and every one of us, we can be out there in the reality of our world, making his vision come true. We can be bringing good news to the poor, liberty to those held in slavery of addictions and compulsions. We can be giving the light of knowledge and vision to those who are blinded by this world's darkness and release those held in the bondage of contempt and prejudice. Too many people, even nominal Christians, are spending too much time ridiculing the Bible, ridiculing religion, and trying to secularize our world. They should be asking the question, why can't we make it all come true? Jesus tells us here, today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Throughout Luke's gospel, the word today appears in key places. At Christmas, we hear the angels announce, today a savior is born. When Jesus meets Zacchaeus, he tells him, today salvation has come to his house. He assures the thief crucified next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. The today Jesus announces isn't the only today of his lifetime. It is our today as well. Luke is reminding us that we don't have to wait for some future time and place for God to come and set us free. It is happening today if you and I let it. Jesus said, the spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me. Today, you and I, we have been anointed by this Holy Spirit to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed. Today, we have been sent by Jesus to act justly and mercifully in large and small ways. It might be good to take just a few minutes now and during the coming weeks to pray that our ears be open to what God is saying to us and for a renewed gift of the Spirit, so we will be willing to respond to the word we hear. Amen.